as a culture, we deprive children not just of play, but we also deprive them of other opportunities to be in charge of their own behavior. And what are you doing when you're doing these independent things? You're learning you can do things. <laughs> these are extraordinarily important learning experiences. I can do this adult-like job where I know I have to show up and do it. And, uh, and that gives you the confidence that you're less frightened of becoming an adult because you know you can hold a job. <laughs> you can earn your own money. And this was common for children. And now we've taken most of that away. Hello, and welcome back to the Hannah Frankman Podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Peter Gray. Peter Gray is a developmental psychologist who studies the importance of play in childhood. His book, Free to Learn, was one of my first introductions to the importance of play in childhood development. And in his work, Peter has studied everything from hunter-gatherer tribes and how children play as their form of education in hunter-gatherer tribes throughout history and across the world to how the modern schooling system quashes children's instincts to play and leads to rises in anxiety and depression and a sense of helplessness as they enter the adult world. In today's conversation, Peter and I talk about why childhood play was an area of interest in his developmental psychology research. We talk about his own experience raising a son who was very rebellious inside the traditional education system and why he ended up sending his child to a very alternative school that allowed for free play. We talk about the outcomes of Sudbury schools and unschooling approaches to education and why those are the two modalities of education that Peter is most bullish about. We talk about how he feels about modalities like Montessori and Waldorf. And we talk about play in the digital age and why parents maybe shouldn't be afraid of video games and how to think about the digital world as another landscape that children have to learn how to navigate and how play can allow them to do so. This conversation was such a delight to have, and I hope you enjoy listening. Peter Gray, welcome to the podcast. Oh, well, thank you and for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I am delighted to have you here. Your book, Free to Learn, was one of the first education books that I think ever crossed my radar years ago when I was first becoming interested in the alternative education world. I grew up homeschooled, so I've kind of been interested in it for a long time for selfish reasons. But when I first became interested in actually studying the field of education. It was one of the first books I ever encountered, so it feels very full circle to have you here today. Um, I'd like to start at the top very quickly. You're a developmental psychologist. For the uninitiated, what does that mean? What do you what do? You do? Well, yeah, I, I sort of became a developmental psychologist. I didn't start <laughs> off that way. I started off really as a neuroscientist studying the brains of rats and mice in the laboratory. And then I got interested in children's development when I had a child who was rebelling in school. And um, I tell the story at the beginning of Free to Learn for people who are interested in the full story. But it was my own son that led me to get interested in kids. And at first I thought I was just doing a little study to understand this alternative school that he was going to, uh, to understand what happens with kids who go to this radically different school. But the, uh, the results of that study led me to really get interested in children's play. So I began calling myself a developmental psychologist as I became less and less of a neuroscientist in the lab. Uh, but I also come to developmental psychology from an evolutionary, biological evolutionary perspective. So, you know, if you want the whole fancy term, I'm an uh, evolutionary developmental psychologist uh, who looks at children's development from uh, a, 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 an evolutionary perspective, Darwinian evolutionary perspective. So basically the perspective is, you know, children come into the world with certain natural tendencies. And um, 
why do those natural tendencies exist? What is the function of those natural tendencies? And so that's been my orientation with within developmental psychology. I mean, for people who just want a broad definition of developmental psychology, it's people who are who are scientists to the degree that you can use science to do this, to study uh, the process of uh, human development, and especially most often among children. You started studying the development of children because of your son, who was rebellious, did not enjoy school in a traditional sense. But you became a scientist of play. You started studying the importance of play in childhood development. How did your research take you there? So I really began um, many years ago. My son had, as I said, been rebelling in public school. Um, he's a very forceful individual. He was born forceful. It had nothing to do with me. It was just <laughs> his nature. <laughs> he, uh, he, you know, he's he's not somebody who uh, accepts situations that don't make sense to him, and so. He simply rebelled constantly from kindergarten on through the fourth grade in the public school, and it reached such a crisis point, we had to find another school. For, we had to find something else for him. At that time, uh, his mother and I were not really in a good position for homeschooling, and homeschooling was much less common than we didn't really think much about homeschooling. So we looked for a school for him. We went to various progressive schools, which we probably couldn't have afforded anyway, but we've but he didn't like them. <laughs> he said, you know, this is a little bit more of a liberal prison, but it's still a prison. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we um we went to uh the Sudbury Valley School, which is a democratic school. It happened to be only two miles from where we lived, had very low tuition, you know, at that time easily walking distance for him. So when we went there, his response as a as nine years old at the time was, "Well, if this is uh, if this isn't just a show, this is this is what a school should be." <laughs> and so he immediately decided this is where he wanted to go, and we were happy. We finally found something <laughs> for him that he that pleased him. Uh, we were tired of fighting with him, and we weren't going to win <laughs> fighting with him. So so. So uh, I was I was very much open to this kind of school, but I had some concerns. Uh, I wasn't really worried about his learning. He was he happened to be a kid who he, was, he always learns, <laughs> and I had no doubt but what he would learn whatever he needed to know to do what he wants to do in life. He he somehow taught himself to read by the time he was three, and he had no difficulty figuring out numbers that he needed, and so on. And that was one of his problems in the public school is that is that everything was terribly boring to him, and the only way he could make it interesting was to do it his own way, and that got on the nerves of the teachers. So I wasn't worried about his learning, but you know, I was concerned about things like, I guess my primary concern for him specifically was, well, if he goes to this school where there's no courses, there's no grades, there's no alternative to grades, there's no evaluation of the kids, um, there's no, um, uh, what if he goes there through, and there's, you know, there's no such thing as high school. There's just kids there and, and they play and explore and do. And so what if he stays there all the way through his, what would be his high school year or someplace else? And suppose, you know, I don't think I'm the kind of parent who would push this, but suppose he decides he wants a career that requires going to college. Can he get into college? That was probably my biggest question regarding him. And the and there was another question too that I had. So you walk through a school like this, and you see a lot of art going on. A lot of kids are into art. You see um, kids really into music. They're jamming on their guitars, and they're you know. So so then I had this little concern: Do they all grow up to be starving artists and musicians living in their parents' basements? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> So between those two questions, I wanted to know what happened with the graduates, and the uh, so I so I took a br little break from my laboratory research, or actually I added this onto my laboratory research um, to do a study of the graduates, um, along with a part-time staff member who helped was very valuable in helping to locate the graduates. Um, 
And uh, we located almost, at that time, the school had already been in existence long enough that there were some graduates who had done all of what would elsewhere be called their K through 12 years of school there. Um, and there were a lot of, there were quite a number of graduates who'd been there at least through what would elsewhere be called high school. And so we found, we identified, we called a person a graduate if they left the school at kind of the typical age, somewhere between 16 and 19, uh, not, re not going on to any other secondary school, um, but going on either to higher education or life in some other way. Uh, that's how we defined a graduate. And um, there were about 80 graduates at that time, and we were able to find almost all of them, and almost all of them filled out a pretty big questionnaire. And what we found was um, they're doing very well in life. Uh, they're doing, I, I, I lost my fear about whether my son could go to college. Those who wanted to go to college seemed to somehow get into college, even though they didn't have any of the supposed requirements for college, they got themselves in. And they seem to do fine, if not excellent, maybe even excellently, many of them in college. They tended to be the very good students in college. Um, and uh, and they were not all artists and musicians. There was a somewhat disproportionate number of artists and musicians, but amazingly, quite a number were actually not living in their parents' basements. They were making decent livings as artists and musicians, so they were pretty good at it. But uh, there was a whole range of people. There were there was a mathematician. There were uh, people in the helping professions. There were people who had started businesses. Uh, there were people who in the who in the crafts. Uh, so there were people in the whole range of of, uh, of careers that we tend to value in our society. So that led me to relax as a parent. But it also the study intrigued me as um, as a researcher, as a, as a scholar. So here's these here's this group of of uh, young adults who did not do anything that looked like school. We have this belief in our culture that if you don't do school, you're going to be a failure in life. <laughs> you know, you, you know that no matter how painful it is, you better go to school because this is maybe bad tasting medicine, but it's medicine and you need it. Uh, that's kind of our attitude about it for kids who resist school. We're convinced this is necessary. They're going to be homeless if they don't make it, if they don't go through school. This is kind of the myth we have in our society. So the... Um, so this was uh, this was kind of a um, from a, from the viewpoint of of what most people think this was kind of a revolutionary observation it, for people who've been doing this for a long time it was not new there have been people writing about this John Holt had been writing about this for years before I got involved with it but for me it was a kind of revelation and I said you know the world needs to know about this and also I want to understand more about what's happening. So here are kids um, who uh, who are doing just what you would think kids would be doing when they're free. <laughs> you know, they're not studying algebra books. <laughs> they're not uh, they're not sitting around and discussing the, the Plato. They're uh, <laughs> you know they're they're uh, they're doing just what you'd think kids would be doing. They're playing. They're exploring. They're getting interested in something and they're pursuing it. You find kids reading but they're reading whatever the books are that interest them. Uh, and they're not necessarily, they're not, I, it's hard to find a textbook. Once in a while you'll find a textbook if somebody is reaching the point where they want, want to apply to college and they know they need to take an SAT test in math, they might be studying some maths to prepare themselves for the SAT test. But other than that, they're they're just doing what you would expect kids to be doing, what typical kids might be doing in the summer or used to be doing in the summer when they were free in the summer and weren't channeled into adult directed activities then. So that's the um, that's the observation, and yet they're becoming educated. So what's happening when they're quote just playing or just hanging out talking to one another? Or, you know, what's really happening? So the next study that we did at the school, uh, I did along with a graduate student who did this work for a doctoral dissertation. Um, we made observations over many, many days. Uh, he did most of the observations. I did some of it of, uh, to see what happened. He was, he was, uh, even though he was a graduate student, he was very young looking and could kind of blend in 
Of course, the kids knew he wasn't a student, but he sort of looked like he could be a student. He was not he was not a threatening, authoritarian kind of figure at all in the school, so he could kind of be a fly in the wall there and observe, and he made a lot of notes about interactions that he observed. And we decided to focus especially on age-mixed interactions uh, because the founder of the school always argued that the school works because it doesn't segregate children by age. And children, when children are playing and interacting with one another, they learn a lot more when they're interacting across age. If you're just interacting with people who are the same age as you, you have less to learn because they know about the same things you know. You know? But if you're interacting with somebody older who has a bigger vocabulary, who has more skilled in certain kinds of things, who can boost you up to higher levels of activity, or if you're interacting with somebody younger who looks up to you and you're kind of a leader to that person and you're kind of help teach that person in the informal way that we all teach one another as we interact with one another. Uh, so in those cases, you're learning a lot more than if you are just interacting with somebody who is the same age as you. That was his argument. So we look specifically at age mix interactions. And in that study, we defined an age mix interaction as one where there was at least four years difference between the oldest and the youngest uh, in participant in that interaction. And, uh, and basically what we found is every interaction that, um, that we observed of this sort was obviously a learning experience most obviously for the younger kids, but it wasn't hard to infer what the older kids were learning too. But the younger kids would always be being boosted up to a higher level of activity. They might be playing a game that involves reading and the older kid can read and the older kid is pointing out the words and and as part of playing the game is teaching the younger one how to read and not deliberately teaching them how to read, but just showing them well, what this word is. Or, that. or they're playing a game that involves numbers and counting up and adding scores or even calculating averages. And the older one gets tired of doing it for the younger one, they show them how to do it. <laughs> and so that, or, or, but it's not just those kinds. I mentioned that because so many people are interested in reading and math, but um, maybe equally important, they're climbing trees, they're throwing balls, they're doing and the older kids are showing the younger kids how to do it, uh, helping them do what would be difficult for them to do if they were doing it all on their own. So that was that was part of our initial study. But the, the whole thing led me to really become interested in play. What is the nature of play? Why why I mean one way to think of it, children come into the world with a number of very strong instincts. They have an instinct to eat when they're hungry, right? It's pretty obvious <laughs> why that's present. They have an instinct to drink when they're thirsty. That's pretty obvious. An instinct to breathe very regularly, right? And they have an instinct to play. <laughs> and every child has this, unless there's something seriously wrong with their brain. Every child has this strong instinct to play. We can kind of drill it out of them if we go long enough not allowing them to play. But but you don't have, never does is there a child who unless it's got a very serious brain abnormality, very far out on the autism spectrum, who doesn't um, who doesn't know how to play and want to play. So the so why is that? <laughs> why did natural selection produce this? And why did natural selection? The other thing we know about play, as I began to study it, look at what anthropologists had found about play around the world is that not only do children come into the world designed to play, but they come into the world designed to play in certain ways. And, and if you look at the ways they play, they match very clearly onto the things that human beings everywhere have to learn to live a satisfying life. We have to learn our language. <laughs> every every human being uh, speak communicate by language. It doesn't mean you can't conceivably get along without it, but it's a big handicap if you don't have language. Children learn language in play. They don't, they're not taught their initial language. They learn it in play. They learn it by hearing it. They learn it by playing with the sounds. They learn it as they get older and they're playing with other children. They're practicing language all the time in play because they have to communicate what they're playing about and how they're playing. So language, there we are the animal that builds things. Children all over the world play at building things. What they build depends upon where they're growing up and depends on their personal interests. But when children have ample time to play, they all play at building things. Um, 
And, and you know, so they're practicing this skill of having an image in your mind of what it is you want to construct and then being able to translate that image in your mind into the actual thing that you're building. It's terribly important human skill throughout history. We're the animal that survives by building things. <laughs> so, we, uh, so we are also an extraordinarily social animal. So it's not surprising that children are very, very motivated to play with other children. Uh, a certain amount of solo play is desired, especially if you're playing at an artistic kind of thing and you just want to do it your own way and you don't want to compromise with somebody else's vision about it. But primarily, children want to play with other children. And most play throughout the world when you go outside of our society where we isolate children from one another so much. Most play is social. Most play is kids playing with other kids. And why this strong drive to play with other kids? It, it ought to be obvious. Maybe the most important thing that we have to learn for a satisfying and meaningful life is how to get along with other people. How to how to uh, how to uh, negotiate with somebody about what we're doing, how to appreciate whether that person is happy or not, you know. And children are practicing that all the time. They want to play with other kids, and the the most uh, the basic freedom of play, as I often point out, is the freedom to quit. So if if we take so for example if you and i were kids and uh, you know we got together to play and let's imagine i was just a bit of a bully and i wanted you to play exactly the way i want you to play if you're a self-respecting child you will say after a little while you'll say okay i'm, I'm going home now <laughs> you know I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do this so you're free to quit and that is a natural consequence to me that, hey, wait a minute, I really want to play with this person, but um, but I guess next time I'm going to have to pay a little more attention to her. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay a little more attention to what this other person wants and not just what I want. So in play, because of the freedom to quit, children are learning how to keep their playmate happy. And what can be a more important lesson than that? You know, if you can't do that, you can't have a good marriage. You can't have real friends. You can't have good work partners. This is a basic human skill to tell whether the person you're interacting with is happy or unhappy <laughs> and to modify your behavior to keep that person relatively happy. Otherwise, they're going to abandon you. And um, if everybody abandons you, you're alone in the world and you really can't survive if you're alone in the world. You certainly can't reproduce <laughs> if you're alone in the world. So that's the, uh, that's the, the you know, so right off you can see some of the really important things children are learning. The other thing, the other thing, maybe the biggest mystery to some people before you really think about it, is children all over the world want to play in risky ways. They want to play with danger. <laughs> they want to do dangerous things. There's actually a researcher in Norway who's quantified, who's, who's, who's listed the kinds of dangers that children all over the world play with. They want to play with fire, love to play with fire. <laughs> they want to play with sharp knives and uh, to dangerous tools. They want to play with heights. They want to climb trees and dive off of cliffs. <laughs> they want to, you know, of course, children vary in how much courage they have to do these things, but they want to do this to the degree that they feel that they can, can do it. Uh, they, they, so, so why do children play with danger where they're actually deliberately putting themselves into situations that create some fear? They're, they're deliberately putting themselves, I'm climbing that tree, I'm afraid of climbing that tree, but yet I'm going up this high. At some point, the fear becomes terror, in which point I come down. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sort of reaching my limit of how much fear I can tolerate. Well, why do children do that? And the answer, it turns out other mammals do the same thing, that they also play in dangerous ways. And the theory which came first from animals, from researchers studying animals, is that they're learning how, they're learning courage, they're practicing courage. They're learning how, they're learning that I can, ex I can do something that's kind of dangerous and I can feel fear and I don't panic. I can manage my fear, I can, man I can control my body even though I'm feeling fear. And so by doing that, they're preparing themselves, not deliberately, but this is the evolutionary reason for doing it. They're preparing themselves for future emergencies. So 
the the little girl who climbs a tree as high as she can do it, and she does this other of these kinds of things. If something then later on in her life, some real emergency occurs, she doesn't fall apart. She knows I I felt this fear before. I can handle this fear. I can I can I can deal with this. So so these are just some of the ways that children play where it's where it's not hard to see how they're acquiring skills that are essential for uh, living a, a satisfying and meaningful life. The other thing that children are doing in all kinds of play, by the way, I should say, I define play as an activity that is initiated and controlled by the players themselves. If an activity is initiated by an adult or in some ways regulated by an adult, then it's not in my definition play. So, Can I interject really quickly? Yes. If a child, so say there is a game that yes. an adult has concocted yeah. and they're requiring the children to play, what would you classify that as? If it's not, the, the players are not choosing it, so it's not play, what is it? Is it work? Well, it's an interesting question. It's a, it's a, it might be a lesson. <laughs> it might be, mm. you know, people talk about playful learning in school where they're setting up a play situation deliberately so the children will learn something as a consequence of that. Um, I should say that I, I, I should qualify what I just said by saying I don't necessarily think of play as an all or none thing. So the way I define that, the way I consider it, uh, an activity is fully play if it has the following characteristics. One is that it's self-chosen and self-directed. Secondly, it is done for its own sake. You're doing it just because you want to do it, not for any reward outside of itself. So if you're doing it primarily to get a trophy or praise from a parent or a teacher or to improve your resume or, or to go to grade in school, any of those kinds of things, to the degree that you're doing it for that, it's not play. Uh, a third characteristic of play is that play is always structured. There's no such thing as unstructured play. It's not, there's no such thing. Play is never random. It's always structured. And it is, and if it's full, if it's true play, it's structured by the children themselves, either because they're creating the structure or they are freely adopting the structure. So let's go back to the example you give. Suppose, a, suppose an adult creates a game for the child if the child thinks, hey, this is really a great game, <laughs> and the child freely chooses to play that, doesn't feel any pressure from the adult to play this game, is not doing it for any reward, not doing it primarily to please the adult, not doing it, then it can still really be play. Ideally, then, this is something the children will decide on their own. Hey, let's play that game that our mom taught us the other day. <laughs> and then, it's mo then it's unquestionably play. It, 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 play includes games with formal rules. Kids playing Candyland or playing games that have rules that are typically kids are always are free to modify the rules, but they may decide let's play by the let's play by the book. Let's play, but it's still their decision to play that way. That's still play as long as as long as they know they're the ones that have decided we're going to follow these rules. There's no coach saying you have to follow these rules, and they're free to modify the rules. That's one of the great things about play is you can learn that the purpose of rules is to make the whole thing more fun and more fair. And if, if the formal rules aren't working out, we'll just change them. <laughs> one example of this that might, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this and might be illuminating for people listening too. I recently had on Chrisman Frank, the co-founder of Synthesis, um, the the game based school that was built for Elon Musk's children and is now like an online oh, virtual yeah. program. Um, and one of the stories that he tells about why he became part of the founding team of Synthesis is he visited Elon Musk's school for SpaceX kids and his own children. And he was there at lunchtime and he saw all these kids who were around the table very boisterously arguing with each other. And he asked the teachers what was going on. And they said, oh, it's this game that we play at school called Synthesis. They're kind of obsessed with it. And now they play it over lunch, too. And that was the thing that he said that that was the part of the school that they drew out and turned into an online program, which is now available for parents to enroll their kids in virtually. Um, 
it sounds to me like that might be an example of what you're talking about, of an adult yeah. constructing a game, but the child, like the indicators that the children want to keep playing it, perhaps. Yeah, that could be. It's a, you'd have to almost get into the kids' heads to be sure of that. But if if they really are truly freely doing, because this is what they want to do, uh, mm -hmm. that's you know, unquestionably that's play. Yeah, if they're doing it because they think, well, this is what. Um, you know what? Even they're even if they're not watching me directly, this is what the leaders of the school kind of want us to do. <laughs> to that degree, it's not so much play, but yeah. But I think that is a good example. And um, you know, play kids learn. Kids. It, it used to be that kids, most of kid play was uh, passed on from one cohort of kids to the next. Yeah, kids would be outdoors playing and. I, I happened to move around a lot as our family moved around a lot. And I learned that in every town, there were different games with different rules, outdoor games, different ways of playing games. And uh, that were part of the culture, the children's culture in that community. And it wasn't learned from adults. It was learned from other kids. So each new crop of kids would learn from older kids the way of playing marbles in that community or the way that you would play the various different ways you could play baseball depending on how many kids you had uh that were that you didn't necessarily have to invent from scratch because other kids had been had already figured this out and was passing it on to to you just just naturally as you played with them i imagine some of that on like a social level is I hesitate to say random because as a scientist, you probably would disagree with that connotation, but more contingent on the individual personalities who are evolving the games and passing them on and less regional in terms of like the actual nature of the place that the kids are in. But I know that in your studies of hunter-gatherer cultures right. and the play inside of those cultures, I would imagine that quite a bit of that is regional in even an ecological sense like it's it's play that is that develops because of the nature of the environment that the children are learning how to navigate how much of play is environmentally influenced yeah environmentally influenced and socially influenced by the culture so it used to be that there were there were researchers uh studying what was called the culture of childhood and this was even in the United States and the UK and Europe, people studying the culture of childhood. And, and I understand very well the culture of childhood. We've more or less destroyed it in modern times in, in our parts of the world. But the culture of childhood exists in hunter-gatherer cultures. It exists in basically all cultures. And it's how children acquire culture. They first, they first adapt themselves to the culture of childhood which is in some ways kind of modeled after the adult culture because children model after. But, but what, I, what I found as a child, as we moved from town to town, there was a different culture of childhood. It wasn't that everybody was involved in it, but, that the, but the, the, the culture of childhood included certain kinds of games that most kids played <laughs> in one way or the other. And so to be part of that culture, when I moved in, I had to learn how to do what the mostly, since at that time, even more than today, play would tended to be sex segregated, not entirely so, but I had to learn what the, what the other boys here were doing. And I had to sort of practice and become good enough that I could join their play uh, and, and get involved in it. So there is, so, you know, you could say this is in some sense an, an extrinsic motivation. You want to join the other kids by learning what they're doing, and, but then it quickly becomes, becomes real play. But there's also a kind of set of meta rules of, uh, in the culture of child. What is, how do you determine what's fair and not fair? How do you negotiate things? What are, What's the common language that you use? And so there's a sort of um, adaptation to the idea that we're growing up in a culture where to some extent you are deliberately modifying your behavior to be part of that culture, to be part of the group that's there. And, and presumably that is practice. We all have to, in one way or in various ways, um, no matter how much we believe we're individuals, 
we all have to uh, conform in some ways to the society that we're living in. Otherwise, we're isolates. Um, um, and so children are to some degree learning that in this culture of childhood. That, that sounds a little bit contradictory to the idea that play is totally free and individual. It's a mix of those of those things. They're trying to adapt to the child's culture, but also at the same time within that, maintaining your individuality. Now, not everybody join. You know, there might be two or three different cultures of childhood within the same town, in the sense, in the sense. So, I was an outdoor person, and so to me, it was getting to playing, playing pickup games of baseball, going fishing, all these kinds of things that the kids were doing. My brother was what we today would call a nerd. He was not an outdoor person. Uh, he was into music and reading and so on. He he had fewer friends, but he had friends, and he was the culture that he was in. In the same community of kids were kids who um, who read comic books and uh, <laughs> talk, collected comic books and listened to music and were uh, knew a lot about uh, a lot about uh, all kinds of things and shared that kind of knowledge. So there can be more than one culture of childhood within a, within a community and different individuals, depending on their predilections, might go towards one or the other. Today's episode is brought to you by the John Galt Mortgage Company. Anybody who knows me well knows that I'm a fan of Ayn Rand's novels. And so I was incredibly excited when I found out my friends were starting a mortgage company named after John Galt. And I was even more excited when I found out what that mortgage company does. My friends, Mitch and Tim, have been working in the real estate world for years, and they realized over time that mortgages are way more expensive than they need to be. So they decided to start a new kind of mortgage, one that caps their profit on every transaction and passes the savings along to you, the buyer, in the form of a lower interest rate. I am not currently in the market for a house, but when I am, I will absolutely be working with Mitch and Tim as my lender. And if you are in the market for a house, you should absolutely check out what they're doing and get a quote for the rates that they can offer you. You can find their work at www.johngaltmortgage.com or you can find a link to their site down in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. Every parent or every adult who has spent time around children has observed children play acting the things that they see adults doing. Kids yeah. love playing store. They love playing house. They love playing take care of the baby. They love playing with their right. play kitchens. They love pretending to be a mechanic like dad and work on their toy car. What is happening? So isn't it interesting that if you watch kids playing, um, they they want to play, they want to play an adult role. They don't want to, you know, if playing house, you know, nobody wants to be the baby. <laughs> Everybody wants to be the mommy or the daddy. <laughs> if they're playing school, even I've even seen kids who are unschooled who play school, <laughs> and they want to be the teacher. I was homeschooled and I played school. Power, you know? <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to be the kids. <laughs> they want to be, so they're playing. They're playing powerful adult roles, and it's partly, I think. I mean, they're depending on, on your point of view about this. Some people think, kind of from a psychoanalytic point of view, think that. Well, you know, I'm little and weak, but I want to be powerful and strong, so I'm playing this powerful and strong role. From a more of an evolutionary point of view, I look at it as it's at some level they know I'm I'm going to grow up to be an adult, and and I need to practice being an adult. I need to practice what it's like to be an adult, um, and and to be an adult of a certain kind. So in hunter gatherer groups. You know, you'll have young boys pretending that they're great hunters and they're acting like adults on a hunt and they're uh, bringing back, you know, they might catch a toad and act like this is a big game that they're bringing back into camp. Uh, so they're, they're playing adult roles and the same thing in our culture. And oftentimes they're playing very, you know, like kids like to play superheroes because they're, they want to play a really strong and competent and powerful person um, and I, and that's part of that's part of growing up it's part of practicing being you can't practicing doing and thinking in ways that you can't actually do in the real world but you can do it in the play world when you 
studied the Sudbury Valley graduates, you talked about this a little bit in your book, you noticed through lines between the things that kids would play in their childhood and adolescence and the types of things that they did for employment as yeah. adults. How common is it to see through lines between a child's interests as they play and the things they gravitate towards in adulthood? And how should a parent think about that when they're observing their child and trying to think about what ways to help provide resources for them or just sort of anticipate right. interests that might develop further as they start to mature? Right. Well, so let me answer this in two ways. The first thing before I forget, I would advise parents not to think too much about this <laughs> because <laughs> I love parents that. who begin thinking about it are going to start intervening. They're going to start trying to direct it and then that can ruin it. And also, it, 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 you know, you really have to trust the child. And so sometimes maybe a parent, parents have their own predilections. So you see the child playing at this, you play the child playing at this, and then you think, Oh, I really like when the child is playing at this <laughs> because maybe the child will become a doctor or whatever it is that I would like the child to be if I could encourage this kind of play. So I think it's better, you know, the child should have a whole menu of possible ways of playing and let the child play it out. So it, now to answer the first part of the question, the I actually went through with both my study of the Graduate of Sudbury Valley School and a later study that I did in collaboration with Gina Riley of grown unschoolers and actually looked at for each of each individual that we studied, they were all adults at the time we studied them, what they told us they were playing at primarily as children and teenagers and what their career was. In about half the cases, in for both the graduate of Sudbury Valley and the unschoolers, there was a very clear connection between what they played at as a child and what their career was. It, it's as if, you know, that some, this doesn't occur for all children, but some children develop a real passionate interest in their play. I'm hesitant to use that as the model because then parents who don't see a passionate interest in their child think, okay, this isn't working. They should be developing a passionate interest. But I think that's a personality characteristic. I don't think everybody gets passionate about some specific interest. There are people who are kind of generalists and they like to live a kind of a general life and they they're not passionate. They may be passionate in other ways, but we also need people like that. We don't, if we had a world of people who were driven to one kind of activity, we wouldn't have, we'd have a lot of people writing books, but nobody reading them. <laughs> you know, we'd have, we'd have a lot of people very busy at activities, but following their passions, but, but not really being good neighbors <laughs> because they don't have time for it. So it's, so it's really important. I, I want to make the point that that this is a personality characteristic. It's it's not necessarily a wonderful thing. It can be a wonderful thing, but it also can be wonderful if somebody is less passionate in, in some single. So I think it's kind of a personality. But so, so about half the kids developed a real passionate interest in something. And then at some point, they figured out a way they can make a living doing this in, in, in some kind of way. So uh, and this was in a very broad range of activities. So for, for, in Free to Learn, I give some examples of, a, for example, a, a woman who, uh, as a girl, played with boats on the pond at the school and got really interested in boats. As a teenager, she apprenticed herself to a ship captain. And as a young adult, she already was captain of her own, of a cruise ship herself. Another case of a boy who was involved with constructive play. He loved to build things, and um, he was sort of a leader of a group of boys who would build whole plasticine villages to scale, and then they would have a war and ruin them, and then they would rebuild them. So the uh, so and and he would take bicycles apart and put them together, or he would get staff members to take him to the dump to bring home bicycle parts and he'd make bic working bicycles from them. So he grew up that he grew up loving to build things and create things. He became a machinist and then an inventor who would invent machines for people who who needed a machine to do something that nobody else had built. 
Those are just a couple of another, but another, just to take a very different example, another one became a professor of mathematics. And he, for whatever reason, de developed a love of mathematics as a young child. Um, so, and and there's one of the, in the unschooling study, there was somebody who made, this is a, this study was done more recently. Uh, so somebody who, uh, as a kid, like a lot of kids, was really into making YouTubes and he became really good at it. And uh, while he was still a teenager, um, he a, uh, a major movie company was he learned was making a film in the city he lived in, and he volunteered to help them. And they were so impressed with what he was able to do and how much he knew that they hired him uh, to go to Hollywood. He wasn't yet twenty when he was hired as into what was his dream career, and ultimately his goal of become a movie producer himself. So. These are just a few of the examples of people who developed real, real passionate interests, and then they found ways to make a living doing really what they love to do. What are the biggest long-term benefits of a childhood full of play, or the biggest things that one develops by having lots of space to play. Some of these things are very intuitive, like you're developing your imaginative capacity, you're developing a relationship with self where you're noticing what you're interested in and then following that interest either to its completion or to its next evolution. Right. But I would imagine there are also very non-obvious to the outside observer benefits of childhood play that are also very important throughout the duration of that child's adult life. Right. So so I would say that a, a very general thing that children are learning whenever they're truly playing, meaning that they're doing this activity where they're in control of the activity. But this can also occur in other act, independent activities. So we, we, as a culture, we deprive children not just of play, but we also deprive them of other opportunities to be in charge of their own behavior. So, whereas we used to send children out to do errands for us, to go grocery shopping for us, all by themselves, <laughs> uh, even at nine or 10 years old, to go down and buy some, some we need some milk and bread, go down the corner store and get it, even, even less than nine and 10 years old, you'd ask children to do that. We don't do that anymore. Children had, I had a paper route by the time I was 11, by the time, and, and many kids did, a lot of, I even, as a boy, was babysitting at age 11 or 12. Who would hire a boy to babysit at any age now, right? So the, so, and girls easily got those kind of jobs. We were mowing lawns, we were, we were doing these independent things, and this was also part of childhood. Uh, and what are you doing when you're doing these independent things you're learning you can do things. <laughs> you're learning that you're learning what psycho you're acquiring what psychologists call an internal locus of control. And an internal locus of control is this sense that you have of I can solve problems, I can do things, I am not a victim of the world around me, I am the master of my own fate. Now, of course, none of us are totally masters of our own fate. But uh, so, but but the, but there's degrees to which we feel that we are, and it turns out that the degree to which you feel, you have this internal sense, I can do things. I, I'm not afraid of the world. I can, you know, to the degree you have that, that protects you from anxiety and depression, because the world is less frightening if you feel you can solve problems that arise in your life. If you, if you haven't had experience solving such problems, because there's always been an adult there to solve the problems for you, or to even protect you from ever getting into a situation where you've got a problem, <laughs> then you don't learn to solve problems. You don't learn that, hey, wait a minute, somebody can bully me. Not everybody in the world is nice. Somebody can bully me, and I don't fall apart. I figure out what to do about the bullying. Somebody, I can get lost. It's impossible to get lost now that we all carry <laughs> GPSs in our pockets, but it used to be possible to get lost. You know, I can get lost and find my way home. I can get into trouble, and I can work my way out of that trouble. I can, you know, I can... I, 
these are extraordinarily important learning experiences. I can do this adult-like job where I know I have to show up and do it. And, uh, and that gives you the confidence that you're less, fright less frightened of, of adult becoming an adult because you know you can hold a job. <laughs> you can earn your own money. You can, you know, you're, and this was common for children. And now we've taken most of that away. And so children are not growing up with these independent experiences. What we know, there's actually a, a way of assessing a, a, a questionnaire that assesses uh, in level of internal locus of control, and it's reasonably valid. And what we know is that people who score high on an internal locus of control are far less likely at any age in their life to suffer from anxiety or depression than kids, than those who score lower on that internal locus of control, who have what so this researchers call it external locus of control, the, fe be, the belief I'm being controlled by circumstance, by powerful other people, by events outside of my own realm of control. I'm kind of, a, I'm growing up as a victim of, of the world rather than as a master of my own, of my own fate. That's a scary position to be in because you can't always rely on other people to save you. And if you don't think you can save yourself, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> You write, have written quite a bit about the decline in play, which you're referencing now, since the 1950s and how that's corresponded with a rise in anxiety and depression in kids, as you just referenced. I feel like there's an interesting parallel between the decline in play and the decline in innovation that a lot of people in the tech world talk about. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the the talks and writings that Peter Thiel has done about this. He's it, it's notable because he launched the Thiel Fellowship, where he gives dropouts or opt outs from college a hundred thousand dollars to go build a project or start a company instead of going to school. And this was sort of the core thesis that he built this around: is that we yeah. are suffering from a lack of innovative young people. Right. And this is a fairly common critique of people in the sort of innovation world that is particularly since the 70s, which would be about when kids in the 50s were, you know, growing up and entering the workforce. There's been a decline in in innovation and invention. Like we've seen this huge rise in computing technology, right? Like digital technology has grown in leaps and bounds. But if you go outside onto the street and you look around with the exception of like the makes of the cars, you kind of could still be in the 1970s. Like a lot of the technology is very similar. The buildings look very similar. The clothes aren't that different. We don't have the like flying cars and colonies on Mars that we were people thought in the mid 20th century we were going to have by now. And I've always wondered if there is a correlation between the decline in play and freedom for children and the corresponding decline in innovation in the types of work that these children do as adults. So it's um, it's interesting. I, I'm with you on at least part of it. I'm not so sure about all of it. Um, here's mm -hmm. here's uh, from the science that I know. So... One thing, there, there's actually a, again, a psychological uh, assessment of creativity. You might think, how can you assess creativity? You know, how can you test for creativity? But it turns out there's a, there's a battery of tests called Torrance's uh, Tests of Creative Thinking, uh, which has been used for decades uh, with normative groups of school-age children at all grade levels. It can be given at all grade levels and had been given to normative groups over many decades. There's a woman, and we know that this is a valid test because it's been used long enough that there's longitudinal data that show that even when you control for all other factors, those kids who score high on this test go on 
to be innovators in the world uh, when they're adults. They're more likely to start new companies, invent new products, create new artistic creations of all sorts. The whole realm of things that we call creative and innovative ventures, they're far more. This test is the best predictor we have of that. It's better than IQ. It's better than teachers' predictions of who's going to be creative and innovative as an adult, better than peer predictions of that. Best test we have of it. Now, it's interesting. There's a woman, her last name is Kim. Uh, she's actually from South Korea. She came to the United States because she felt that South Korean system was was squelching her ability to be creative. So she came to the United States and became a professor of psychology studying creativity. And she analyzed, a few years ago, she analyzed the scores on these tests over over decades. And she found that beginning, interestingly, 1984 seemed to be the turning point, scores started going down. <laughs> and going down, to, the, the, she did this study kind of about 2008 or something like that, it continued to go down to such a level that the average score in at the end of this period, around two, 2011, would have been only at the 15th percentile in 1984. I mean, that's a huge drop. <laughs> wow. Now, in other words, 85% of people, were, of kids at school, were more creative by this test in 1984 than they were in 2011. Now, what I attribute it to, and I think what she also attributes it to, is the fact that the school system changed. So this is part of the change. The school system changed to take all the creativity out of school. Uh, it used to be that you spent sometimes, you know, just decorating the classroom in a creative way for holidays. You'd spend, you had, you had recesses, which is always creative play. You had long lunch hours when you could be creative. You had art and music classes, which were not the most creative things, but they were at least somewhat more creative than, you know, than your math class. Uh, so the so in addition, you know, we were giving more homework, less time to be creative out of school, and we were depriving children of play outside of school and play is where you develop creativity. So it, it made sense that this would decline as we were taking creative opportunities for children to practice being creative uh, over this period of time. And I, I think the 1980s was the time when there was really beginning to be, I mean, the, the decline in play was occurring all along, beginning even in, as early as the 1960s, but it really kind of accelerated in the 1980s. She also, interestingly, has studied um, has studied creativity across cultures, and she's found that those cultures where the test scores on the PISA test, the academic test scores, are the highest, are also the cultures where children are the least creative. <laughs> And and uh, so that's uh, and then there's one other study that's interesting that there's a study that I quoted in a blog post of, of two or three years ago uh, that looked at um, they used an index of interest in innovation for college students. How interested are you? That kind of assessment of how whether they're oriented towards a career and a path that involves invention or in, in innovation of one sort or another, versus uh, a more tried and true kind of path or more predictable. Um, and uh, and it turns out that there was a negative correlation between grade point average and interest in innovation. Those with the highest grade point average were the least interested in innovation. So again, it fits with the with the uh, the view that with our with our way of doing schooling, even in college, let alone high school, we are we are constructing a situation where you achieve by not being innovative <laughs> by doing exactly what you're told to do. And so we are creating a group of, of young people who want to be told what to do rather than to figure it out for themselves. And we hear that in a lot of ways. It's I hear it from, I'm no longer teaching. I haven't been teaching for many years, but um, even, even back when I was teaching, we were beginning to see this trend. And now the trend is much greater. Students in college 
want to be told exactly what to do. They don't want to be told, write a term paper on some general topic related to this course. They want to know exactly what they should write the term paper on and how they should write it. They want to be told details. They don't want to have to figure something out. That would be too risky. They might make a wrong choice. And we hear from employers uh, who are employing young college graduates um, who say, so, you know, I hire, I, hire, I hire these people to solve problems for me, but they want me to solve the problem and then tell them how to do it. <laughs> so I think your point is well taken that for, for some reason, we're in an age when we need creative and innovative people more than ever, all the non, most of the non-creative jobs have been taken over by robots and computers. We don't need people to do routine work. We don't need people who are good at crunching numbers or memorizing a lot of information because we've got computers to do that. We certainly don't need com people to assembly to assemble things. We've got robots to do that. We need people who can ask questions that nobody else has asked and answer questions that nobody else has answered and who can, who, we need people with social skills. We don't need the kind of people that we're training in school. And yet the training in school is going more and more in the wrong direction as we suppress creativity more and more. So I do think that this is, that this is happening. A lot of it has to do a lot of it has to do with the change in, in schooling where there's much less freedom for teachers to be creative and do creative things in the classroom because especially since Common Core, teachers are being required to stay right on the page that they're supposed to pay, stay on and that everybody's supposed to be doing the same thing regardless of their interests. Uh, so, so yes, I think this is absolutely happening. You've spoken very positively about Sudbury schools and about unschooling. Are there other alternative models of education that you're also excited about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you about a couple specific models? Sure. And get your take. Um, I'm very curious what you think about Montessori education. So it depends upon which Montessori school. Um, so there are some Montessori schools where, where I think Montessori herself would roll over in her grave if she thought this, her name was being used for this. But um, I, I, there are some things, obviously, I like about Montessori schools. They tend to be somewhat age mixed, you know, kids over, in, which I believe in. They tend to uh, have more time for play. They tend to... Here's what I don't like about Montessori schools. Uh, at least some of the uh, Marie Montessori herself was working initially with kids who had some kind of a disorder, and she it was very important to her with these kids to ground them in reality and get them away from fantasy. <laughs> so for the kids she was working with, it was she discouraged fantasy play and encourage constructive play. So she developed this set of sort of toys and blocks that were all designed to engage the children, but to engage them in ways that they were learning certain lessons. <laughs> so it isn't totally free play, it's playful. It's like playful learning is, is what people call this today, where the teacher has in mind certain lessons and the teacher is controlling what the play things are so that the children will learn those things. Now, that's a lot better than the typical school, I have to say, but it's still not really free play. It's not really, it's a, it's a, it, and so, uh, I, and, and I applaud the fact, I mean, I'm glad there are such schools because there are a lot of families that would never unschool their kids and they would never send their child to a Sudbury school, but they would send their child to a Montessori school or to certain other progressive schools. The difference, the basic difference is one thing that one thing you can say about Montessori schools and other progressive schools, they tend to be very expensive. <laughs> and the reason they're very expensive is you, is you need a fairly high level of number of staff per student <laughs> um, because the staff have to be able to pay attention to the individual kids. And the staff are still 
ultimately responsible for the children's learning. There's the understanding. The parents expect the staff to be responsible. If my child isn't learning anything, that means the staff aren't doing their job. Uh, whereas at a Sudbury school, a parent comes and says, my child isn't learning anything. And the, and the staff member says, well, that's up to your child. That's not up. To, that's not me. That's your child. Your child is not interested in learning anything. Although, I, although the staff members might say you might be wrong. Your child might actually be learning a lot of stuff that you're not actually noticing. <laughs> but the uh, but that so that's a real difference in a in a in any in a Montessori school or other kinds of pro, so-called progressive schools. There's a lot more freedom for the kids, and there's a lot more choice, there's a lot more playfulness involved, but there's still the staff, the sense that the staff is ultimately responsible for the child's learning. What about Waldorf schools? Waldorf schools, so again, there's some things I like about Waldorf schools, and there's some things I don't like about them. There's a certain sense in which they're stuck in the past. <laughs> you know, they're not up to date. <laughs> you know, this was a model developed when toys were made out of wood, <laughs> you know, and there was no electronics and so on and so forth. I'll tell you a little story about Montes about a Waldorf family. So this was, uh, I was at a, at a conference on alternative schooling where there were people speaking from various, who were involved with various different kinds of alternative schools. And there was a woman there who talked who was not a staff member at a Waldorf school, but whose child children had been students at a Waldorf school. And so she was showing pictures of their Waldorf family and you know, wearing wool caps and playing with wooden toys. And and uh, Waldorf actually discourages you from learning how to read until you're seven, as if it would be harmful for you to learn how to read earlier than that. Uh, so there, so there's a kind of certain kind of rigidity about it. Uh, and and so she was describing how she her son was begging her for a computer. <laughs> But because they're a Waldorf family, they couldn't get a computer. Now, Waldorf believes doesn't really believe in computers <laughs> for kids. And so there, she was resisting getting the computer. And then she described this incident where her son had a terrible accident on his bicycle. And he almost lost his life. And he was in the hospital for a long period of time and still begging for a computer. And they finally took pity on him and bought him a computer because what else could he do while he's stuck indoors? And she said, and he said, oh, it was worth it. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was worth this whole thing I've gone through. <laughs> so any system that, does, that denies children in this day and age of a computer I don't agree with. The computer is the primary tool of our culture today. And you're stuck in the past and keeping your child stuck in the past if you don't let your child have a computer. So, I, I, you know, I trust children. I trust children over educational philosophers. <laughs> children, children know what they want. They know what they need. They're going to learn from what they want if, if, uh, if they can get it. <laughs> that doesn't mean we should give them everything that they want on some whim. But if somebody is just begging for a computer all along and you're holding it back, not because you can't afford a computer, <laughs> you're really depriving your child of a growth opportunity. Technology is one of the big arguments that often comes up in response to unschooling, as I'm sure you're very familiar. Yes. Um, people are particularly, they're very worried about their kids getting lost in the digital world, and they're particularly worried about video games. How do you think about video games in relationship to this very virtuous and beneficial developmental play that you've been talking about? Video games are without question play, and uh, they're very, uh, they're difficult. Uh, most of the video games nowadays are social. Uh, they're highly creative. Um, there is, there's actually dozens, probably by this point, even hundreds of studies. There are many reviews of such studies that basically show that playing video games builds brain power more than anything else you can do. 
Uh, there is a greater drive. There's a drive now. People my age should be playing video games. It protects you from losing the mental abilities, the like ability to remember what's important or not important, ability to make quick and accurate decisions. There are there are a lot of studies of this sort. Um, not so much now, but back when video games were newer. And you could find people who didn't play video games. And most of the people you found were women. Co most of these studies were with college women who were not playing video games. And you actually do a study where to be in the experimental group, you're required to play a certain video game. And this was done with various different games, a certain number of hours a week for a certain number of weeks. And you're given basically an IQ test before and after, or tests of things like what are an IQ test. And study after study shows that playing the video game improves your score on those kinds of tasks, and and that improvement lasts. Um, the now there's lots of such studies, and there's even studies showing that parts of the brain grow. Of course, the brain is like a muscle in a way, and if you're exercising those parts of the brain that are involved in holding a lot of information in your mind at once, making quick decisions being able to change your strategy when the game strategy changes, all these kinds of mental abilities, these are all being exercised. And the parts of the brain involved in these things, there's studies actually showing that these grow. So, so, so parents who want their kids to be smart ought to be not preventing them from playing video games. <laughs> Secondly, the initial fear was that a lot of the video games were violent and boys were playing these violent video games. Boys have always been attracted to violent play. I mean, when I was a kid, we played cops and robbers. We had cap guns. We shoot one another. I killed lots of cops as a kid. <laughs> I did not grow up to be a cop killer. And as far as I know, none of my <laughs> friends did either. Kids know the difference between play, between, between violence that's play and that's not. And every study that has looked at real world violence as a function of playing video games has shown no effect, no relationship between how much you play the. You can find case histories. You could find one or two examples of a school shooter who had played a lot of video games. But on the other hand, most young men and boys of the age of school shooters play a lot of video games. So the only way you could really tell is look overall. What about all the school shooters? And it turns out that school shooters on average, somebody actually did this, are less likely to have played violent video games or any video games than than uh, the than the average population of boys and men of the age of school shooters. So there's really zero evidence that of that fear. There are studies people thought it would lead to social isolation, but especially as the games became more and more social, and this is what the kids talk about when they get together. This is the this is this is the thing they socialize about, and they're and they're playing cooperatively when they're playing when they're playing these games. There's also there's research showing that just like other kinds of play, playing these games improves creativity. Um, there was a study done a few years ago by the headed by the uh, Columbia University School of Mental Health, the Mailman School of Mental Health, but also in collaboration with several universities in Europe, where um, that involved thousands of children between the age of six and ten, and they assessed the amount of time they were playing vid video games by interviewing the parents about the number of hours a week they're playing video games. And independently of that, through teachers, they assessed things like how socially competent would you rate this child as, how emotionally stable you would rate the child as, how bright in terms of schoolwork. On every single measure, those who were playing more video games scored higher than those who were playing less. So the so the very things that we're afraid of are it's the, the what really happens is the opposite of that. Um, now, on the other hand, that's not to say that video game play can't be problematic, just like anything can be problematic if you get involved in it in a way that... Um, so here's where I would worry about video games, where I would think almost the word addiction is appropriate, even though I still don't think it's really addiction where you've got a kid who's just playing video games all the time, but the video games are not making the kid happy is playing the video games and still is depressed. <laughs> and um, then why, you know, so, so then this video game is not 
this video game is not solving whatever the problem is for the child. <laughs> and maybe even helping to prevent the child from solving the problem because the child isn't daring to try anything else. I think that the order of what happens here, and there's some research that bears this out, that it's not that the video game is causing the depression, but the depression is causing the video game play because the child is depressed. The only thing the child feels willing and able to do is to play the video game, not able to actually go out and meet people in the real world, not to take initiative to do something else. The video game becomes kind of a distraction, something you can do that helps distract you temporarily from your depression, but it's not solving the depression. So for a child like that, I think what needs to be done is not take the video game away, because now you're taking the crutch away that the child has, but to talk with the child to try to understand what is really the problem. <laughs> and maybe the child needs therapy, maybe the child, but maybe it's just a matter of really talking with the child, trying to understand, you know, um, you're, you're playing video games a lot, you're, you're not happy. <laughs> you know, let's talk about this. Are there things that, you, that you're thinking that you could do that would maybe make you actually happy <laughs> that, that we could try to arrange to do that. I think that's the approach in those, in those cases. And this is true for, for adults as well. I mean, there are, there are a lot of adults who become depressed and then they spend their time playing video games instead of they stop going to work and they're playing video games. Are they stopping going to work because of the video games or are they stopping going to work because they're depressed and now they're playing the video games also because they're depressed? So I do think that's a problem. I don't think it's just a mouth. There are, there are kids, there are graduates of Sudbury Valley, you know, just like when I was a kid, as I said, like my brother, there were kids who didn't go out to play. They just read, <laughs> you know, they did indoor things. There are kids today who spend most of their time doing indoor things, whether it's video games, making YouTubes, whether, you know, all kinds of things that are actually creative uh, and growth promoting, but to the adult looking at it, it just looks like, oh, this is screen time. This is more screen time. And we put it all in this category of screen time. Even not recognizing, well, screen time is, is a million different things. <laughs> you know, The screen has become, it's the telephone, it's the, it's the movie theater, it's the newspaper, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's your, creative device for writing. It's how you keep in touch with other people. It's how you write stories. It's all, it's all of this. And this is the world we're in. And, um, and if, if we deprive children of that, we're depriving them of the opportunity to learn how to live in this world that we're in. It's a little bit like, so to me, taking away the digital world from children is just like taking away the outdoor world from children. When we began to think it's dangerous for children to be outdoors, we stopped letting them go outdoors. <laughs> and then they discovered, well, I can still play. <laughs> I can still do the fun things now on the computer. If we take that away <laughs> and we don't allow them outdoors and other people aren't allowing their kids outdoors, so even if we do let them outdoors, there's nobody to play with. If we take that away, we're taking away their total freedom. <laughs> So that's the uh, that's my view on it. I think that I think that I think that what's happened, and I see it in this book, The Anxious Generation, and I know John Haidt, um, and I've argued with him, uh, and uh, and I think he truly believes what he wrote, and I think Jane Twenge does too, who's clanging the alarm about video game, about social media. Um, they're not the people doing the actual research. The people doing the actual research are saying the evidence is not there. Just as was true, the same thing now is true about social media and all the fear about social media as 10 years ago is true about all the fears about video, about video games. Everybody was afraid of video games. Now that's calmed down because the evidence is so strong that video games aren't causing any harm. Most adults now play video games, so they're less afraid of video games, at least most young adults do. So, but social media is a little newer, and uh, we see kids burying their faces in it, adults are burying their faces in it too. And so we think this can't be good for them, but, if, but the actual studies don't show that it's doing 
overall any harm. That doesn't mean that it's not causing some harm for some kids. And it doesn't mean that there aren't, that I think that there's room. I think that adults, just like adults, should be teaching safety rules for outdoors. They should be teaching safety rules for um, for the for the vid- for the digital world. Um, you know, there are certain common sense things like, you know, if somebody's asking you for money, <laughs> a parent who I've heard of parents who complain that their kids are spending working up the parents' credit card, buying stuff online or gambling or doing something, they get drawn into it. And I say, why do you let your kid have your credit card? <laughs> you know, that's crazy. <laughs> that's not that's you that's crazy, not your kid. <laughs> I don't say it that way, to the parent, but that's the message I'm trying to get across. You know, pornography, I believe, I, I don't know that there's any, I honestly don't know, I truly don't know if there's data that it's truly harmful. Boys have always been drawn to pornography, but I don't think it's good for kids to be watching pornography much. I I would forbid for pornography. I would cut off pornography for kids. Uh, Sudbury School doesn't allow kids to be watching pornography at the school. They don't have other restraints on it, on use of on use of digital technology. I also think that there are situations where it's reasonable for a family to, or for a summer camp or a school to say, for this period of time, nobody's going to have their smartphone in front of them. <laughs> During dinner, we're present for each other at dinner. And this applies to the adults as well as the kids. Nobody is going to have, all the smart guns get off. If somebody beeps you, you're not going to answer it because you're not even going to hear the beep. It's going to be off another. Don't take it to bed with you. <laughs> kids are being deprived of sleep because they get drawn onto the smartphone at, at, at bed. You can't resist. I can understand that. If I have it in bed and it beeps, I'm tempted to lift it up or I'm tempted to, I start thinking of something as I'm trying to go to sleep and then I want to look it up on the phone. And that's not good for my sleep. So I'm better off not having it in the bedroom. <laughs> and that's a, that's a way of self-discipline. I keep it out of the bedroom. Um, it's, I think it's very appropriate in certain situations. Like this is going to be a period of time for outdoor play. We've got all these kids together, no cell phones while you're outdoor playing. This is a time to be with one another. So I think that, I think that there, that there are, and then there are certain rules that every, just so kids are not necessary. We think of kids as sort of their native to all this. And so they're supposed to understand all this, but they don't necessarily never put anything out into the internet that you wouldn't want a future possible employer to see <laughs> you know they know that if you put it out there it's there don't trust your boyfriend or girlfriend to keep that naked picture of you private <laughs> you know that's uh, that's crazy to do that <laughs> and, and and yet kids do these cuz adults do it too you know it's not only kids it's adults who do these absolutely stupid things and 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 we we probably ought to have if there's some, anything that we ought to be teaching it's safe use of digital technology, but that's different from depriving kids of it. It's a difference between when I was a kid, parents taught their children how to cross the street safely, taught them if somebody stops in a car and there's a stranger and they invite you into their car with candy. Don't go. <laughs> you know this could be dangerous. Uh, so there were certain safety rules that, that were understood, that were taught, and kids can follow these rules. And then, and that makes it then safer for kids to be outdoors. Similarly, there should be rules about use of digital technology. What does the transition look like between a childhood of play and the adulthood that it facilitates? What what does the transitionary period through adolescence look like once an adolescent is moving into the adult world? What does it look like? What are the things that stay the same? Does a child who has complete freedom to play maintain right. a sense of playfulness into adulthood that a child who didn't have a chance to play might lack? Is play also important in adulthood? How do you think about this? So I think that that one of the things that uh, in our studies of adults who grew up with self-directed education um, 
is that they told us quite explicitly, those we asked, um, that the transition they believe is much more natural than it would be if they'd been to a regular school. So if you go, if you've been to a regular school, you are the transition, even say the transition from high school to college, what it's not so much true today, but but not that long ago, we, when you were at home and you were being told what to do by your parents and pretty much told what to do at school, now you're suddenly off in college and there are things you're supposed to do, but there's nobody looking over your shoulder telling you to do it. <laughs> and as a consequence, kids get drunk. <laughs> they do stupid things. <laughs> they skip class because they've got a hangover. <laughs> the amount of drinking uh, among young college students is huge. And, and this has been true for a long time. One of the things that those, when I asked graduates of Sudbury Valley and I was growing on schoolers that went on to college, what, what did you like and what were dis those disappointing about college? And one of the most disappointing things was how immature their classmates were. <laughs> If they were going to college, they were going to college because they had a reason to go and they wanted to go to class. It wasn't to drink, <laughs> they, you know, that was, to, and, and they reckon, you know, they, you, they had more of a sense of self-control, not surprising because they were growing up with a sense of self-control. So they never really lost that sense. So they have a sense of personal responsibility. I, my health is in my hands now. I can't rely on my mom to tell me not to go out and to prevent me from going out and, and drinking. You know, I've got to I've got to make that decision myself. So that's part of it. But also, just the transition. You, know, when you are when you are in a Sudbury school or you're unschooled, you're not in a in a separate world from the real world as you are when you're in a typical school. A typical school this is clearly not the real world. You're you're there where everybody else is the same age as you. You're there where you're told to do these things that have very little relationship to the real world. <laughs> There's not even a pretend relationship to the world world where you're learning these things only so that you can pass and make it to the next grade, which is so it's an it's separate from the real world. When you are home uh, and uh, unschooled or when you're in a Sudbury school, you're doing real world things. You're cooking, you're interacting with adults as well as kids of all ages. You're involved with little children. You're learning to be a parent because you're involved with little children. You're learning how to communicate with people of all ages, not just the teacher on the one hand and the other kids your own age on, on this hand. You're really growing up in a world like the world you're going to live in when you're a grown up. <laughs> and so the transition is much more natural and easy. And, and there's even less of a transition between when you're not employed and when you're earning your own income. What I've found is a lot of kids in, at Sudbury schools or uh, on school, because they've got time during the day, get do get part-time jobs. They figure out how to get part-time jobs. Or they might even be making money with their hobby. That kid I mentioned who made YouTubes, you know, he was making some money with his YouTubes just as a kid. And uh, and some, key, some people are actually, they're not making a lot of money, but they're selling some of their art or their photography. They're, they're actually already kind of in their career, <laughs> even while they're children. And so there's no sudden distinction. Now I'm a student and now I'm an adult. <laughs> it's just a, I'm a person doing what I want to do. And as I become older, I have to take increasing amounts of responsibility for making my own living. And at some point, I hope I'm completely independent financially from my parents. And who doesn't want to be that? So that's the, um, I think it's a much more natural transition. What are the biggest things that kill a child's instinct to play? You had a few interesting anecdotes in the book. You talked about how during the Holocaust, children in concentration cap camps were still playing with each other and they were acting out things that they were seeing. They were using play as a means of processing the situation they were in and learning how to navigate this world that they found themselves thrust into. So clearly, traumatic events are not shutting down a child's circuitry to play. They're still right. they're using play as a tool to, to handle right. these situations. What are the things 
that shut down the play instinct and the drive to play? In a way, there's a very simple answer to that. It's controlling adults. It's adults who are not allowing the kids to play in their natural ways, who want, who believe they know better what the kids should be doing. And this occurs in school and it occurs out of school. So um, in some ways, our whole society has changed in ways that make it less possible for kids to get away from adults. And when kids can't get away from adults, then you also have a world where adults are presented almost all the time with propaganda saying, it's your job to always be involved with your child. <laughs> That's your job. You know, this, there's a wonderful book. I don't know if you've read it, um, uh, called The Gardener and the Carpenter, um, uh, by a, by a well-known, uh, developmental psychologist who's, who's um, I'll, I'll think of her name in a moment, but she draws, she's, saying that what's happened over decades is parents have become more like carpenters and less like gardeners. <laughs> a, a gardener, the gardener analogy to being a parent is you plant the seed and you provide, you provide a good environment, you provide fertile soil, <laughs> and then you let it grow. <laughs> Maybe you pull out some weeds now and then, you know, but you let it grow. You, you can't control its growth. It grows from inside. That's the gardener model of being a parent. The carpenter model is you have an image of what this child should be. <laughs> and you're trying to shape the child into that image the way a carpenter would shape the piece of furniture the carpenter is building. She argues that over time, for a variety of reasons, we have become less like gardeners and more like carpenters as parents. She, she even objects to the word parenting. She says this was never, parent, parent was never a verb <laughs> until something like the 1970s. Um, being a parent is a relationship. It's, it's a certain kind of relationship with you have with your child. It's not a job. It's not a chore. <laughs> it's a relationship. And, and we, of course, we make it a chore. Everybody talks about how hard it is to be a parent. Nobody used to talk about how hard it is to be a parent. Parents had five, six, seven, eight kids. Part of the reason they had kids was the kids would help them. <laughs> you know? Parents, uh, parent, you know, we've made, parent, we made being a parent a job because we've defined it as a job. You're supposed to constantly be with your child. You're supposed to do all these things for your child. Instead of letting the kid out, being doing things with other kids and learning from other kids and learning from the world outdoors, we've parents and especially mothers have taken over that whole job and now it becomes a job. And so, and so the word, so now parent, and, and it's also the other thing that I think plays a role is over time, uh, partly because, and, and this is a good thing, partly because women are in the workplace and they have careers, people are having children later in life than they used to. So if you're 20 years old and you become a mom, as my mom was when I, she was 20, or maybe 21 when I was actually born, uh, what did she know? <laughs> you know? All she knew was, you know, she had siblings, she grew up, and so, you know, she... She did what what made she did what kind of made common sense to her. She didn't have any sense of I have a lot of knowledge and I'm going to shape this child to be what I want it to be. I, I'm just kind of trusting the process here. A lot of people have kids, and I'm you know that was kind of more the attitude. And that's sort of if you're a young person, it's a little. But if you if you say you've had a job and you've been in a, you've been in a professional job, and when you have this job. That job is your responsibility, and the product is your responsibility. And then if you take that same attitude towards being a parent, now the child is your project, your, your product, <laughs> and you feel responsible for how that product turns out. And that is harmful for you and for your child. <laughs> 
because you now are anxious all the time about how the child is turning out, because you blame yourself if the child isn't turning out the way you or other people want the child to turn out. And the child feels bad because I'm not turning out the way my mom wants me to turn out. So a better attitude would be one like, you know, what I always try to encourage is the belief, I think Khalil Gibran said this, your child is not your child. Your child is, your child is, a, is a stranger who's come into your home <laughs> who's living there for a period of time. <laughs> and your job is to make the stranger comfortable to the degree <laughs> and to uh, welcome them into your home to try to, to try to help this stranger in whatever the stranger sees as their need for help, but not to impose upon this stranger your desire of who that stranger should become. So if we could take more of that attitude, uh, in, even in my textbook, I'm author of an introductory textbook, I say, what when you reproduce, you don't reproduce. <laughs> you're not producing another you. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, this, this offspring is some mix of your genes and the other parent's genes, but it's an entirely new person. It's not you. It's not a reflection of you. <laughs> it's not how you should be judging yourself. As, as This is an entirely new human being. Your only job is to try to get to know that human being just like you would try to get to know your husband or wife <laughs> and to be a good partner to that human being. And of course, with a little child, the child has needs more than your husband, different than what your husband or wife needs. And that's a given, of course. But by the age of a certain age, the child is kind of independent of those needs, at least much more independent of those needs than before. And we have to start letting the child exert that independence. This has been such a fun conversation. If people want to know more about you and the work that you do, obviously, I would highly recommend your book, Free to Learn. But where else would you send people to read more about your work or perhaps get in touch? So I've been, um, for the last somewhat more than a, about a year, I've been doing a substack called Play Makes Us Human. And there are now about 50 uh, essays on that. Uh, most of them uh, research-based, documented research-based. So the substack Play Makes Us Human, you can subscribe for it free or you can voluntarily pay $50 a year. For, uh, um, but I welcome people who want to subscribe free and you get it every new one you get in your email if you subscribe. But you can also go to the, to the just by Googling Peter Gray, um, uh, Play Makes Us Human, uh, you can find it and you can look at any of those essays. I've also for many years been writing a blog for Psychology Today, less so re recently, but on there, I have something like 250 essays over many years on topics like this. And you can go to the table of contents and see essays there. Another thing you can do is I have a personal web page, um, just, uh, just petergray.org, it's easy to find. Um, and uh, on that page, among other things, you can find um, many of my academic articles, PDFs of my academic articles, and easily download them. And I write, in, even when I'm writing in academic journals, I write in, in uh, language that anybody can understand. And so those are, those are another place people can, can see my work. And I've written articles, for example, on hunter-gatherer children and how they educate themselves, and artic lots of articles on grown on articles on grown on schoolers and articles on Sudbury schoolers, articles on on uh, on articles that dispel a lot of the myths of our culture that such as that if you don't go to college, your life will be ruined. <laughs> that, uh, the, the, um, there's still lots of good jobs out there that don't require college. Um, so that's uh, so. There's a lot of ways to get in touch with what I'm doing. I'm currently I just submitted a proposal for a new book, but it'll be at least a year before that's out. So that's exciting. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, this has been such a delight. Thank you so much for taking the time for this. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Great questions. Have a lovely rest of your day. You too. Bye bye.
All right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you found this valuable. Please leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Please like the video on YouTube. And please don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to make sure that you don't miss next week's episode. Thank you so much, friends. I will see you next week.